Okay. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Um, I hadn't confected any clever prayer tonight, so tonight it's boilerplate, boilerplate prayer night. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Y'all remind me, you don't let me out here tonight without the, without the closing acclamation, since I forget when I'm, by my, when I'm thinking by myself, I'm a danger to myself and others. Um, there are a couple things I wanted to get out of my system from um, a couple of weeks ago, or last week. Right, Y'all remember the stick? Right. Okay. I forgot something, I think. I, I'm so old, I can't even remember what I forget. I remember saying in German that the word for a stick is a, is a stab, S-T-A-B, like staff. All right. And the reason I was bringing that up is that in, in, in German, um, if they want to talk about what the scale is of something, in, in English we would say the scale is 1 to 100. And in German they say the stab, it would you know, be like the stab equals 1. You know, it was 100 feet, that, that, that kind of thing. You know, one inch equals 100 feet. Anyway, it's because their word for scale is actually stick, a staff, which goes all the way back to the Greek idea about the, 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 the stick being the regular thing that doesn't change. And the other thing I wanted to cover and I don't think I brought up is that, as I think I mentioned that the word, we get the word canon from that same Greek root. And that, and that that's why, for instance, we have the canon of the mass because it's as regular as a measuring stick. It doesn't change. It's the same at every mass. And we don't have them in the Catholic Church, but I know the Anglican Church has a, has a position called canon. And I think every Episcopal diocese has a canon who's like a step beneath the bishop. And he's called the canon because I think he's, his responsibility is to make sure that things are always done the way they're supposed to be done. I'm just speculating, but just wanted to elaborate a little bit about all the stick business, which of course is interest in, endlessly fascinating. Um, and the other thing, oh, how did I forget this last, last week? When we were talking about all the media, and I left this out, and I must have lost my mind. I figure everybody in here is going, well, what about John 9? You left that out. Anyway, so briefly, I'm going to cover that. Uh, the man born blind. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. Well, I guess that covers it. His disciples asked him, I love it, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And, and this is like classic intelligent, but, but, but not up at Jesus level thinking, they're saying, look, the only reason that somebody would be born blind or be blind is that they committed some dreadful, dreadful sin and God's letting them have it because that's what they deserve, or the parents committed some dreadful sin and he's, they're, God's punishing the parents by making the baby blind. So there. And so they want to know, well, which was it, Jesus? <laughs> and Jesus says, well, neither he nor his parents sin. It's so that the works of God might be visible through him. Ooh, I love it. We have to do the works of the one who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. With that, he spat on the ground. And then he got some dirt. That's some Adama. And he mixed it together to make some mud. And he rubbed it on the, on the blind guy's eyes. And y'all all know this story. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And so first of all, what did the blind man do? He did what he was told. He did what God told him to do. Yes. And then, of course, he could see, which is terrific. And I love the little bits because Jesus could have just said, he could have just, just touched him and said, you can see. Or he could have just put his hands on it. You can see. He could have done anything. But instead, he, he takes some, some dirt and rubs it on his eyes. Now, one reason I'm fond of this, two reasons. The first is that it obliges the man to cooperate. The man must do some work of his own. He must act in faith instead of just... Wipe it off and saying, oh, whoever is that doing that to me, leave me alone. Centurion, come, come take this man away. No. Instead, instead, he's like, he doesn't know who this is. He, he does what he goes out and washes, and of course, then he can see. Um, and it's just true. So he participates. And of course, the, the mud is, is, I think, is what G, Jesus is doing, the mud, so that he can draw conclusions about the Pharisees in, 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 in the rest of the chapter. So it's like saying, okay, this man was blind, and I'm putting this mud on his eye just to kind of visually emphasize the man's blindness. And then he washes off the mud that would obscure his vision, and, and now he can see. So anyway, <laughs> his neighbors and those who had seen him earlier as a beggar said, isn't this the one who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is. But others said, nah, he just looks like him. And he said, I am. <laughs> and they said to him, they said to him, so how are your eyes open? 
He said, the man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said, go wash. And I went there and washed and I was able to see. And they said to him, where is he? And he said, well, I don't know. So they brought him to the Pharisees. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And remember, you know what that reminds me? Is, is remember there was that, the other guy, the other guy um, who Jesus who Jesus healed. Remember, he, I think he laid he just laid hands on the other blind man's eyes, and he took his hands away and he said, "Well," and the man said, ah, "I can see men walking like trees." And, and I always thought, boy, if that is an authentic testimony, if you've been blind from birth and you open your eyes, you don't know what the hell you're looking at. <laughs> and, and so then the next thing is it just says, and so Jesus put his hands on him again. He said, how about now? He says, ah, now I can see clearly a little extra dose of, 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 of Jesus juice that he's able to see. And it's like, I always think about like, like when people, if, you've, if you have been blind since birth, your brain has no way to process what, what, what data is coming in. It's just terrific. Anyway. So they brought him to the Pharisees, and it says, Jesus made plain, opened his eyes on the Sabbath. Oh, dear, working on the Sabbath. So anyway, this is the Pharisees asked him how he was able to see, and they said, he put clay on my eyes, and I washed, so now I can see. The Pharisees said, this man is not from God. This is talking about Jesus, because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. And then other people said, how can a sinful man do signs like that? So they were all having a conniption fit. And then the blind man says, they said, what do you have to say about him? And he says, I don't know, he's a prophet, I guess. And of course, then they had another fit. And uh, moving that down to keep this from taking up the whole class, which it could, um, they called the man for a second time and said, give God the praise. We know that that man's a sinner. He said, if he's a sinner, I don't know. All I know is that I was blind and now I see. They said, what did he do to you? He says, I told you already. You didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? No. No, they don't want to become his disciples. They ridiculed him. They said, you're his disciples. We're disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but we don't know where this one is from. So anyway, he says, well, I don't know where he's from either, but he opened my eyes. So for me, case closed. Anyway, they go on and on. Finally, they, they're, they're just out of it, and they say, he says, if this man were not, the, the, the poor blind guy said, if this man were not from God, he wouldn't be able to do anything. And they answered and said to him, you were born totally in, in sin, and now you're trying to instruct us. It's like, it's like, we are the Pharisees. We know the scriptures. We devote our lives to it. Now you're going to sit here, and, and you're going to preach to me about what God wants us to do. It's like, get lost. You, you're, like a, you're, you're a doofus. You can't even read. You won't be able to see for 15 minutes. So they get really, really fed up. And then, you know, then, they go, then they go talk to his parents. And his, and his parents have a connection fit. It's like they go to the parents and say, all right, fess up. We know that you, he's been able to see from birth, and y'all faked the whole thing since he was a newborn. And they said, no, we, we don't know what to say. We're, he's been blind liars. We don't know what to tell you about any of this. He said, if you don't fess up, you're out of the synagogue. They said, we still don't know what to say. They said, all right, that's it. Out. Out of the synagogue. So it's just, I just love this story because, you know, people are always saying the thing, well, well if, if, say, today, well, if I could see thus and so, or something were demonstrated to me, or it didn't have to be all taken of faith, well, I would believe too. But I love the story because it's like, how much more evidence do you need? Even the Pharisees knew the kid had been, the guy had been blind all his life. And then it's like, the thing is worth it. He says, this is what he did. I'm telling you again, this is what he did. I'm telling you another time, this is what he did. It's never going to change. And they just refuse and refuse to believe. And it's just perfect because then, then Jesus says, you know, the problem with you guys is, he was blind, but he had faith, and now he sees. But you say that you see, so your sin remains. And I love the way he conflates the ailment of human beings, because, of course, if, if Adam and Eve would have never had a child born blind if, he, if they'd been living in Eden the whole time. No, that's exactly right. It is a consequence of sin. Um, but, but the thing is, is that the Pharisees are just hanging on so tight, so tight, they just don't want to let go, and the, kind of the whole thing ends, you know, the Pharisees are never satisfied, and Jesus goes on about his business. Anyway, but the whole thing with the mud is just a terrific little media story, where Jesus is doing that because he loves us. He could have just said, okay, you can see now, bye. But no, it's like all this trouble. This trouble say, well, I, I felt the clay. I saw him do this. There's no way that Jesus could have faked this. There's no way that anybody else could have done it. We saw him do something physical that, that came into our eyes so that we could understand. Same thing with sacraments, which was the point of last week. Okay. Now, where are we starting on tonight? Oh, we're starting on the Mass. I'm going to try and slam through the Mass in two periods if you can believe such a thing is possible. I guess we'll find out. Uh, okay, first, here's a good question. Was Jesus a good Jew? Yes. Yeah, he was a good Jew. What did he do on Saturday? He went to the temple. He sure did go to the temple. He went to the temple. Excuse me. I'm already jumping again. Okay. 
So Jesus went to synagogue. By the way, I love this. Um, synagogue. That's how we spell it. Yeah, trust me, it says synagogue. That's a Greek root, more or less means like to be led together. Gogos is to lead, and um, sin is together. So it's like the rabbi leads everyone together. And, and in fact, um, in Jesus' day, they were using this Greek word to describe that building. It's amazing that this couldn't find, I have not ever found a Hebrew word for this word. It just shows how, how prevalent Greek was in, in Jesus' day. Yeah, and so let's see. What kind of thing would happen in the synagogue? One thing we know that Jesus did in the synagogue, what was that? He read the scripture. Yeah, what did he read? Anybody, come on, what did he read? Isaiah. Yeah, okay, everybody's on the ball. Y'all remember stuff about what's better than I do. Yeah, he read Isaiah. So this would be a typical kind of thing that would, that would happen in the synagogue. And in fact, when I was a teenager, I was real curious about Jewish stuff. And I went with my father to the local uh, synagogue like out on North Main Street. And it was really interesting because so much of it was like the first half of Catholic Mass. Um, and essentially what happened is, is, you know, everybody sat down and then, you know, you'd sing a song, sing a hymn. And it seems like, you no know, uh, one person would read from the Torah and then they sang another hymn. And then I think the, uh, the rabbi read from the Torah and then the rabbi commented on, thing, on, on what he had read. And then they had another hymn. And that might have been, that might have been what, it, what it consisted of, um, which is a whole lot like what Jesus would have probably done in his day in the synagogue. And then what would Jesus have probably done every year, time and money permitting? Yeah, where to? The temple. Thank you all. Yeah, he'd go to the temple. Now, I want to think about it this way. And then he would make a sacrifice. He would offer a sacrifice. Now remember, this is a critical, so trust me, that's a sacrifice. Um, is what would, what would a good Jewish person, what would be the quintessential thing a Jewish person, a Jewish man would bring to the temple? A lamb. A lamb. Thank you, Mike. And by the way, when you brought the lamb, did you slaughter the lamb? No. No, no you did not. You offered, but you did not sacrifice. The, the minister of priesthood took care of that business for you. All right. So what I want to put it in, 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 in this way. Yes, the synagogue was for the book, and the temple was for the blood. And then what we're going to look at is how the mass is both. It's like I say in Sunday school, one for the book, one for the blood, one for both. And this would be a synagogue and temple and a church. My goodness. Church. There. Correctly spelled and even legible. Yes. Okay. So, and remember um, something I'd also like to, to bring up at this point too, is um, remember after, during Acts of the Apostles, um, that, that the apostles, after Jesus had risen to heaven and they got all fired up by the Holy Spirit at Pentecost and weren't afraid anymore, it was like every day they were over at the temple preaching about Jesus Christ and his, <laughs> his new deal. And all the temple staff were having a conniption fit. And you know they would beat them silly and say, now, you better shut up or we're going to really do worse than that. And they'd say, oh, we ain't shutting up. And then they'd go back and then they'd leave and they'd come back the next day. We ain't shutting up about Jesus. And they'd beat them up some good soldiers, beat them up some more. Anyway, what they were, it's obvious that they, they didn't consider themselves bad Jews. And they were coming to the temple, and they were going. They were going to pray. They were going to, everything they were supposed to do is good Jewish people. But what happened over time in the Acts, as you see, is that is that the Christians began to, I think, partly voluntarily secede and partly are pushed out of, of of the temple world. It's like you can't keep coming in here. Eventually, they will they will beat you to death or something. So they finally stayed away. Now, that would have been kind of an everyday thing they might do. Um, what would so what, we're, what, what history tells us, is, as, as best I understand it, is that the things that they, and they were no longer welcome in the synagogues either, is that on, on the Sabbath day, on the Saturday, they would get together and they would do the things that they had done in the synagogue. And who knows, there might have been converts who had been rabbis who, who ran the show. So they would sing hymns, they would read from the Old Testament, the rabbi or, or actually probably an elder or presbyter priest would comment, that kind of thing. And that's what they would do on Saturday. What would they do on Sunday? Break bread. Yeah, break bread. I love it. Yeah. So on 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 Saturday, they would they would do they would do the book, and then on Sunday, they would do the blood. Let's put it that way, or the bread. Look at attack of the bees. How helpful is that? Um, now, one reason I think this is this is particularly noteworthy, of course, is later these two things became conflated onto the onto the the new the new Sabbath on Sunday. Um, 
something I find is kind of instructive about that is that remember, what, are we, what, what is being reenacted with the breaking of the bread? The last supper. Yeah, yeah, the last supper. What day of the week was that? Thursday. Thursday. Yeah, Thursday. But yeah, here we are. We're not doing it on Thursday. We're doing it on the day of Jesus' resurrection. And this is the reason why, and I'm not saying that what I'm about to say is the reason why it was done, but it is consistent with the church having it, record, having it done on the day that God, Jesus, resurrected, not on the day that he actually instituted it. Is you remember in, um, let's see, Luke's Gospel 24, let's see. Uh, is it Luke 24, he said? And the crowd said, maybe. Uh, he's turning pages. There it is. Okay. I think we covered part of this already. Is um, This is the day that, that on the road to Emmaus, and, and the two disciples are, are walking along the road and everything, and then Jesus <laughs> comes up and draws near and walks with them, and their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. Prevented, mind you. And, and he said, what are you all discussing as you walk along? And they were downcast, and they said, you're the only person in town that doesn't know what, what happened to Jesus in Nazareth in the last couple of days? I mean, they obviously don't recognize him. And they go on and on about Jesus and how sad it is. And Anyway, so finally, he, at the end of it, he says, oh, you all are so foolish and so, so slow of heart to believe all that the prophets spoke. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and enter into his glory? They're probably not scriptural enthusiasts anyway. Who knows if they can even read? But he's probably talking about Isaiah. And then, I love it, it says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them what referred to him in all the scriptures. It's so wonderful. Now, while they were walking to Emmaus, that's understood to be about a, uh, like about a three, four hour walk. And so we assume that if he's explaining all the scriptures to them, he might be using the whole time. All of that time might be saying, oh, and remember Jeremiah, yeah, yeah. And how about Isaiah? Yeah, oh, interesting, yeah. And how about this? Ooh, cool, yeah. And they don't know. Now, through all these hours of walking with Jesus, while he explains things to them about himself, out of the Holy Scriptures. Do they recognize him? No. 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 When do they recognize him? The At the breaking of the bread. That's the moment that they recognize him. And I think that's establishing a, a relationship between the written word and the living word that comes to us through the Last Supper. So that it makes sense that, that on Easter Sunday, the disciples did not recognize Jesus until he broke bread, which to me is a reason or a support or consistent with the worldview. The Catholic Church says, yeah, we need to be doing that on Sunday when they recognized him through the breaking of the bread that same day. That's, so it's like, yeah, we know it was instituted on Thursday night, but, but it, really, it really has its impact with like average people who believe in Jesus, boom, on Sunday. So it got moved to Sunday, and then the Catholics are doing both of these things together at the same time. Now, we're actually going to look at the Mass a little bit. Um, let's see. I guess we'll start at the beginning. That would be a good place. Now remember, oh, this is something else. Is remember, the, 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 the Mass divides into two parts. When I was a kid, it was called the Misa Catechumenorum, the Mass of the Catechumens. And the second part was the... Misa Fidelium, I think, the Mass of the Faithful. That was sort of was my daddy's uh, Latin, Latin missal. <laughs> anyway, and obviously the Mass of Catechumens for the Catechumens of the Faithful, the Faithful. And today is an interesting distinction. As we call the two parts the Liturgy of the Word and the Liturgy of the Eucharist. And Liturgy is a Greek word, of course. I think we touched on Liturgy a little bit. Um, the liturgy just... The, the, it's, it's like, whoa, jumping ahead. Here we go. L-E-I-Turgos. Leiturgos. And the lady means, means people or public. And remember, of course, even our word public comes from people in, in, in Latin. So it's the work, and this is work like energy, the erg, like a dramaturg is someone who writes dramas. So it's the people work is what we're going to be doing at Mass. In other words, we have to act in faith at Mass. We have to participate, and we have to actually do work, as we will see. And when I was a kid, like I'm saying, that the Mass, the first half was the Misa Catechumenum, Catechumenorum. Um, Misa, of course, is Latin, like as in dismiss or miss, mission. And you'll probably already know this. Um, this is for y'all out in YouTube land. Um, mission means to, means to be sent. Okay, and, and it's just like in English we have dismiss means to be sent out. So at the end of the Mass we say in, the, in Latin, misa ite est, and it's, it is dismissed, go out. 
And the older way of referring to the mass of that first half is the me 